As part of their enduring commitment to justice, equity, and expression, the Open Society Foundations are proud to sponsor Many Lumens. You're listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Mayori Carmel Holmes, founder and artistic director of Black Star Projects. For this episode, I'm joined by writer, artist, and chef Tunde Wei. For Tunde, food has become a way of critiquing power and privilege. He's owned restaurants and created social practice projects that examine gentrification and comment on economic disparity. His writing has been featured in City Lab, Civil Eats, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Tunde joined our conversation from Lagos, his hometown and where he's currently based. We talk about how he owes me a husband and how the familiarity of a homeland can stay in our bodies regardless of our time spent away. Tunde shares his family's expectations of him and how stepping outside of our parents' desires can be liberating. We explore how his connection to food has evolved and how he's merged his art with activism. Well, welcome to Many Lumens. I wanted to start off with a pretty basic question. You know, where did you grow up? I feel like every time I've spoken to you in these past six years or so, you're in a different city, and I'm curious if you ha- also had an equally migratory childhood. No, I actually grew up in the place I'm in right now. I grew up in Lagos. I was here till I was 16. And I'm saying that just so you know, if you hear any background noise, I'm in traffic. And Lagos traffic is crazy. I grew up in Ikeja, which is like a neighborhood in Lagos. And then I moved to the U.S. when I was 16. So that sort of it was pretty stable. And what prompted your move to the States? So I had finished high school and the idea was to come to the U.S. for college. I tried. I gave college a try, I guess. (laughs) What did you try? What were you majoring in and where did you go? So the plan, which is my mother's plan, was to have me do pharmacy and then do medicine. Mm -hmm, Of course. But then I went to community college and then I was going to transfer to a four-year college and then do all this. But I ended up spending like six years in community college because... I just kept failing all of the science classes mm-hmm. because that was not my destiny. And so by the time I finished, like I jumped from science to like studying economics and Chinese for one semester. Then I took a long break and I was like, I, I just need to get a degree. And I, I was studying marketing and then that ended. So that was the last thing I was doing. Okay. So Tunde, can you tell me at 16 when you came from Lagos to Detroit, is that correct? Yeah, I came to Detroit. And what were you reading? You know, what were you listening to? What were you watching? Like, what were your dreams for yourself at 16 coming to the U.S.? Man, I don't even think I knew anything. I remember just, like, being interested in Ameritrade and, like, stock stuff. But it's kind of hard to explain. It's like growing up in one country and then moving to a whole new other country. I was just exploring. I would walk from my aunt's apartment where I was staying, like, 45 minutes an hour to the library at a university and I'll just go in in chat rooms and I'll be chatting with all these different people on MSN chats and stuff. Um, I would be walking and as I I was walking, I would be memorizing the type of cars that were driving by. I was watching the way people dressed, the way they talked, the way they interacted uh, with each other. So I was just taking in all sorts of random information. None of What I saw was unfamiliar to me, you know, conceptually, because like growing up in Nigeria, all we consumed was American culture. But like being there was different. My sensory reality was uh, catching up to the things that I had in my brain. Hmm. Well, I I imagine it must have been quite shocking, too. I mean, I've not been to Lagos, but my understanding is that it's like, you know, bustling metropolis, like it's filled with people. And Detroit in the late 90s or early 2000s must have been completely the opposite. It must have felt like, I don't know, (laughs) like it must have been dropped into like bizarro world. What was that like to go from Lagos to Detroit? Yeah, so we first moved to the west side of Detroit, and those were pretty dense um, neighborhoods. Okay. Detroit isn't re- really a walking city. It's a, it's a car town. 
I could walk on the street and probably not see anybody for a while. And, and in fact, I think that's sort of like in a lot of, you know, affluent or even middle class communities, like the way you tell who is working class is people who are walking. But what was bizarre was I knew who I was. I knew myself, but myself had been transported into something else. The only thing familiar about where I was was me. That was it. And it's the same feeling that I had when I came back to Lagos is like, with a slight difference. So I came back after 20 years for the first time, like two years ago. And the, and the difference was that I recognized myself, but then I had these nostalgic memories of everything that I was seeing, even though I hadn't seen it in a while or hadn't seen them at all. Like I'll go to different parts of town, but everything was recognizable and maybe familiar, but it was still new, if that, if that makes any sense. Oh no, it totally makes sense. I met a, this white man in Lagos and this man had the audacity to tell me that he's more Nigerian than me because I had been a, away for 20 years and he had lived that amount of time here. And I was just <laughs> like, you don't, even, you don't even know it's in my nostrils. That's how it is. Like I smell things that are like Nigerian, you know, like that's, that's what it is. It's in my skin. You know, it's not it's not in how long I've stayed or, or not stayed, you know? Yeah. So speaking of Nigerian smells, <laughs> I want to like move a little bit into what interested you in food? You know, what sort of pushed you into that as a vocation? Yeah, the reason why I went with food was because of all the things I had done, it was the thing that at the time I had found the most success with. So I definitely wasn't always thinking about cooking. And I came into it by happenstance. I was sort of like at a turning point in my life. But I just needed to do something different. And I thought I was going to move to Chicago for school, but I wasn't able to attend the school. So I decided to come back to Detroit. I just said yes to like all these different things that were, that were happening. And one of the things that happened was I was talking to my former roommate at the time. And he just mentioned like in the most casual way ever that he was thinking about opening up a restaurant and then I said let's do it and he was like sure I remember I just started making phone calls because at that time in Detroit I had enough relationships and I knew enough people in about a month I had found this restaurant that didn't need much from us I had just happened to have finished some work projects that I said yes to that gave me like four thousand dollars he had some money, about $4,000, and we opened up this restaurant for $8,000. And we just, like, let, we just did it. Like, our restaurant, initially, like, there was some buzz around it, but that buzz died down, and then we were, like, struggling. The concept was we had different chefs come in to cook multi-course pre-fee meals. So we, me, Norma, we just sort of, like, held the space, and we, we would do the, the serving. So... As sort of interest was waning in our new concept, this one chef who was pretty popular in Detroit, I reached out to him and I'm like, yo, do you want to do a dinner? And he said, yes. And the food critic for the Detroit Free Press, which is the largest daily in Michigan, I believe, came through to our little restaurant and she wrote like uh, her, her review. And since that time, we just kept like selling out. And I'm like, yo, if people kind of fuck with me for this and they think it's it's smart or clever or it works, then I'm going to stick with the food thing. And that's what I've been doing since. So was this um, Revolver? Is that this initial concept? Yes, Revolver. Okay. The aptly named. <laughs> um, what gave you the permission to move from the intentions that you had as a teenager to, you know, you abandoned pursuing pharmacy and pursuing becoming a doctor. How did you feel comfortable not doing what I imagine your parents had hoped for you? You know, <laughs> I was never going to be a doctor. That was like never going to happen. By the time I opened up that restaurant, I was like, a failure to my parents. I mean, they wouldn't say it, but maybe they would say it actually uh, <laughs> at the time. No, for real. Like between 2013 and 2003, you call those the, the lost decade in my life. That's what <laughs> is dramatic with his, with his words. So I think like I had always done things differently. I don't know why, but what I realized was every time I went against my parents' wishes, I was very successful. So that's like a strategy <laughs> that I began to employ. 
I'm like, if my parents <laughs> approve, I probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's for real. I'm just being. But the truth too about about them is like, my parents are always right. They're always right. But what is right for them is not right for me. So after your lost decade, you know, what is it that your parents think of your career at this point? At this point, they still, my mom is still disappointed that I don't have a degree and I don't have children and I don't make enough money for my dad. He wants me to make millions. So there's that. They also, I mean, they say really sweet things. Like my mom, one time she said, Something between pride and envy for the sort of life that I, I live. And and one time my mom was compl- complaining to my dad about me not getting a first degree. And my dad said to her that I'm worth more than a PhD. I mean, he never said this to my face, but <laughs> it's the rumor in the family. That it was said. So yeah, so it's complicated. I, I will tell you something, and this is like speaks to why I'm you know, late for this podcast and I'm also in an Uber trying to get home. It's because my mom is currently in the hospital and so, like, we're trying to, you know, make sure that she's fine as as my brother earlier. The thing that I think my mom is realizing is that she has raised kids that are there for her. And so all the other shit that she was thinking about, like, oh, you don't have a degree, you don't have children, it doesn't matter because, like, I'm in the hospital sleeping on the couch, like, watching her as she's, um, you know, recuperating or healing. And then she always says some shit. She's just like, oh, thank you for your love and concern. Like, every time we make jokes about it. But like, she sees, I guess, to a certain extent, that has more value. Yeah, actually, I I shouldn't lie. It doesn't have more value, but it's valuable (laughs) uh, or close to as valuable as a a first degree. That's really beautiful. And I want to send healing vibes her way. Um, and thank you for doing this despite coming from the hospital. Um, did you develop a love for food because of your mother? Did she have a distinguished cooking practice or foods that you love from growing up? I definitely didn't think that I should start cooking because of my mom's food and cooking. I mean, she cooked as a matter of course because we had to eat, and, but she cooked well. My parents were actually cool about the kind of food that they exposed us to because my mom is from two different tribes and so is my dad. So we ate like food from Yoruba culture, ethic food, Ishekiri food and Edo food. And we ate, we ate like European food from time to time. Speaking of, who makes better jollof rice? Is it Nigerians <laughs> or is it Ghanaians? Yo, you know what? I've never had... Either I've had, I've never had Ghanaian jollof rice. When I did have it, it was really, it was not good enough for me to remember. Um, but I would say, and I think, I think a lot of people agree that Senegalese cheb, their chebujen is like, it's that's the best. Yeah, but like, yo, you might fuck around and come to like a party in Lagos, and you have some party jollof. Basically, it's cooked over firewood so it's smoke infused basically uh it is amazing you know nigerian food to me is one of the best food ways out here but um yeah um our first episode of this season we interviewed yaba blay who's Ghanaian, of course but we did a segment with her for a show last year called black star live and yaba learned to cook jollof rice from a nigerian um wale oyajide but Yaba told us off camera, <laughs> and now I'm exposing her to the world, that the Senegalese is actually the best. And part of it is that, you know, jollof comes from Wolof, like it is their rice. <laughs> so, of course, they would be the best at it, which I had I'm, not known about that etymology. Right. I mean, that is anecdotal. I don't think anybody can say categorically <laughs> that <laughs> jollof is from Wolof. I mean, it sounds good, but nobody knows for sure. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have a question to ask you. I just realized this. Is Black Star, is it from Ghana or inspired by Ghana? Definitely inspired by. Um, Yaba actually gave the name to the festival, but it's, you know, because it has infinite meaning. So it is thinking about Nkrumah and thinking about uh, Marcus Garvey, who Nkrumah is referencing. And so with the very first festival, we were wanting to be 
Pan-African and thinking about diasporic Blackness very intentionally. And so that layered with looking at film as the art of light, thinking about Black people in this form, it was like it had a um, multivalent meaning. Um, well, <laughs> this actually segues really lovely into the next question, which is about political imperative. Um, you're really clear about that in your work. Um, I read that you have said, my cooking has always been political. It began as an oppositional response to foodie culture, nauseatingly self-referential and boastful. And I was curious, where does this clarity come from? My God, I am nauseating when I when I hear back things that I wrote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when, I, when I had the restaurant, Revolver, our food was just, for lack of a better term, cutting edge. There was this new crop of chefs in Detroit at the time that was matching this wave that was happening. So I wasn't familiar with with any of the foods, but I had sort of like a front row seat to what was culinarily relevant in Detroit at the time. And I would taste some things that I absolutely loved. And my partner, Peter, who's white and American, would be like, oh, this is bullshit. And I'll taste some things that I hated. And he'd be like, this is amazing. And I just realized that I had a different frame of reference. The experience at the restaurant, just little things that happened. For example, we used to play music with the, with the dinners. And so one time we were playing some Miles. And then I switched it up to some Biggie. And then this lady called me over and she was like, can you change the music back to the jazz? It goes better with the food. <laughs> and I'm like, you know that the same projections that have been put on hip hop were put on jazz. And so that's sort of disconnection between the, the historical reality of music and how that translated just throughout the restaurant and, and all these other different ways just made me realize that there was quote unquote foodie culture, you know, that was motivated in, in some sense by particular trends. And if you stepped outside of those trends, then you weren't cool enough or good enough. And I, I didn't want to play that game because I knew that I, I wasn't equipped. Like I didn't have the palate for that game. But what I knew was Nigerian food. Nigerian food was, to me, straightforward. Shit was either delicious or not delicious. Uh, we didn't pass out flavors. We didn't, like, at least not when I was growing up, talk about different elements of a plate. Like, a plate didn't need to have crunch or texture and color and dimension it just was what it was and so i think by dint of me being outside of the game i said just create my own game i'm like i know this food i know what this is and this is the game i'm playing my position is to like reorient everybody towards my understanding of the world and that was where the oppositional reality came from like who cares if american foodies or white folks or European or, or anybody thinks that to be classically trained in French cuisine is the epitome of good food. But there are more conversations and like systems beyond all of those things. And so when I realized that there were other fights to have, um, I sort of like stopped talking about food culture. I only talked about food culture to the extent that I could talk about the other things that I, I want to talk about, like race, that was where my politics really began to, to mature and to have an articulated expression when I started cooking and connecting that cooking to race relations and questions of race in America. So I think about um, your some of the projects after Revolver, some of the pop-up projects like Sarchi, where you charge white people basically back for what they did to the cold crush, right? And then I think about <laughs> <laughs> the project where I saw you last. I almost spit out my drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember the name of it, but the project where I saw you last, wild. where you charged American citizens more than immigrants. Do you remember that? Yeah, marriage trumps all. Yes, and the prospect of marriage was on the table, and I wanted to make sure you knew that I didn't find a husband, so you owe me. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, I think about... Are you still looking for a husband? <laughs> uh, perhaps. Um, 
but I, I think about that those projects and, you know, I think about other projects similar, you know, to that as Conflict Kitchen or things that Ghetto Gastro has been doing and just like political food experiments and wondering where you see yourself in this assemblage. If we were to talk about the evolution of my politics, I would say it went from sort of like broad cultural critique that wasn't grounded in any sort of like political theory, moved to critical race theory and like understanding the world through a critical race lens. And then it's encompassing a class analysis as well. And unfortunately, I am sequential in this way. So I think for me, right now, I think a lot about class and I need to do better. You know, I need to have my class analysis be more intersectional. My work is currently for me about elucidating how dire things are materially for folk, you know, especially for on the continent. There's a connection to to the U.S., of course. The obvious connection is one of solidarity, which is like, you know, Black folks in America, Black folks on the continent are the same people or at least come from the same stock. But there's another sort of uh, connection that I haven't been successful in articulating through my work, at least, is that there's a responsibility that Black folks in the U.S. have as part of an imperial machine. And there is some sort of Black American imperial tendency. And even if there wasn't, which there is, there has to be the knowledge that American culture, which is American soft power, is Black culture. And that is being used to colonize other cultures in different ways. Whether there's a soft colonization that has little material effects or has larger scale effects. Like I tell people like, Puff Daddy raised me. All the fucking bad boy record albums, like when I was in Nigeria, that's all we listened to. We would wear like Timberland boots and camouflage pants and Nautica and polos. That's all we're doing. I think for me, there's a connectedness between thinking about the global South, but there's also something about the dire material life of Black people in the U.S. And so I think like this conversation or this idea about Black American imperialism is also related to class, right? Like not all Black people in the U.S. have the capacity to be imperialist or have access to resources to even like enact that imperialism. So I just want to like trouble that just slightly. I wouldn't want that statement to go (laughs) untroubled in this conversation. But I I do want to say that I am for and pro all working class folk. And to the point about not every African American has the ability to exploit, you know, this sort of like imperial possibility is also connected to the fact that like uh, American cultural imperialism, a lot of it is from the ex- exploitation of working class Black folks too. So it's that sort of complicated uh, reality. Um, I, I also want to come back just because you brought it up and and I had it for a different section, but I want to come to it now to think about gender. Um, You wrote an article, and I imagine hearing things you wrote about several years ago, but in 2017, there's an article in the San Francisco Chronicle called Black Women Are the Future of the Food Industry, right? Um, And you're uplifting the contributions of some Black women in food justice and culinary movements. And I'm just curious, um, beyond kind of, you know, rampant misogyny and misogynoir in the food industry, what led you to write that? Um, and and sort of what has shifted um, in your understanding of, uh, yeah, just sort of uh, the role of Black women in... uh, Yeah, yeah. This is the hardest question in the world for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I don't know, you know, this is definitely not the space to, like, share some shit, but I I embody all the things I was criticizing in that essay. I did then and I I, I do now. Mm-hmm. And there's no separation between me. Well, well there, there isn't, uh, conceptually, there's, there's, there's no separation between me and the critiques that I made about gender. I have, you know, in the past, exploited my male privilege and something that I, I struggle with. In, in fact, if there was a crux of my, you know, spiritual struggle, it's that. Mm. Um, I used to call myself a fuck boy. I used to, uh, like as a joke, but also as a truth. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, I'll just fuck it. I'll just say, it. like, I, I was non-monogamous. Um, 
So like dating multiple people, uh, unaware of like, not maybe not unaware is the right word, but, um, but creating, uh, I think creating a lot of trauma for, for my, for, for my partners. And, um, and then, you know, is it like a recent personal thing that happened that I have been processing in my own way for the last like six months. And it sort of like made me take a decision, um, to take a step back from relationships or even any sort of like romantic connection. Mm-hmm. I'm saying all this to say that I realized that, I, you know, fuck boy was not the term that I should be using for myself. Mm-hmm. It is like, I am product of some, of some trauma. Right. And that trauma and the choices that I made in regards to that trauma, because different people suffer trauma but people make choices differently, you know? So yeah. trauma doesn't always lead to, to, to certain actions. But the choice that I made based on my histories um, created really difficult situations for myself and for my partners. And so I started thinking about this, like, label fuckboy differently. Um, and to me, the question about, like, how I feel about, like, Black women and women in general, it's just like a hard one for me to, to answer because I, I'm working, I'm working through some shit, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm actively in this moment as we're speaking, like working through a whole bunch of shit. And, um, yeah. And that's where it is for me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did want to go back a little bit and I'm curious if you remember, you emailed me in 2016, I think, when I was working at the ICA. And you said something along the lines of, you need me at this museum. <laughs> Give me a date. I mean, it was something like that. <laughs> and I just remember being completely taken aback. Like, who is this person? Um, and I was in doing research for our interview. I was watching a New York Times video um, in which your former partner, Claire, shares this as a tactic of yours, saying Tunde hits up people and basically says, give me a check. And it works. And I'm wondering, it must have worked for you, but I wonder if it worked on Black people, because it didn't work on me. But I wonder <laughs> for you, like, <laughs> what was this strategy? And do you continue to push people in this way? No, I, uh, I, don't, use, <laughs> I don't use that approach anymore. I sort of honed that approach in 20, 20, I want to say 2013 when I went on my first cooking tour. I, I couldn't play games. I was undocumented. Part of why I left my restaurant in New Orleans in 2013 was because I didn't own the restaurant that I started with my partner. We went to the bank together to open up a joint account and I couldn't because I didn't have an ID or a passport or whatever they needed because I wasn't a U.S. citizen. So when it came to this disagreement to, between my partner and I, I had to leave because like technically I didn't own the restaurant. Even though my name was in the paper as the co-owner and all that shit. And I wasn't desperate because like I sort of moved with some intention, but I was like, fuck it, you know? Like... I want something, I need it. I don't have like a fallback plan. I, that was the work that I was doing. So I, I approached it with a certain aggressiveness, but I tried to be charming too. And so, so that was sort of like how I, how I moved then. I don't think I moved so much that way now. I think I'm less impatient than I was then. And, but also you did need me in 2016. Yeah, you know, I'm just, <laughs> I was also speaking the truth. <laughs> okay, fair. Black Star Projects celebrates and uplifts Black, Brown, and Indigenous artists. We produce the annual Black Star Film Festival, many lumens, scene, and other projects creating the spaces and resources artists need to thrive. Learn more and support our work at blackstarfest.org. You're listening to Many Lumens. Now back to my interview with Tunde Wei. 
we've talked about Sarchi, you know, the things that you did after Revolver. You had Lagos as a stall in New Orleans. And then in recent years, you've had a number of online experiments, including selling overpriced salt. And so, so much of this, for me, looks like what people have been calling social practice in the last decade in the art world. And I was curious, are there any other projects or collectives or artists that you drew inspiration from? Um, I would say I was doing what I was inspired to do. And then later on, I'll hear about something and I'm like, oh, shit, this is connected. So, for example, the person that comes to mind is David Hammonds. But like before him, I was thinking about Fela, and not necessarily about his music, but about his whole life as practice. I think there's a line, there's a, like an art language that folks use when they say like, oh, my life is my practice. But it's different when you're someone like Fela when you went to prison. I'm talking about like broken bones and, you know, a dead mother and all of these things that come with living under a regime of oppression that you have to, to fight against. So I think Fela was, a, was like a huge inspiration for me, not his music, but the way he lived his life. Because I sort of fancied myself, definitely not to the extent at all that he did, but as somebody that would put myself on the line in my work, that's the thing that I sometimes hope to move towards. Like, how can I sacrifice more of myself in some way? Um, so yeah, those were, those were sort of the artists I would be like, uh, inspired by. So one of the things that comes up in um, a lot of the work is this incredible kind of satirical impulse. And so I think about a project like Hot Chicken Shit, <laughs> where you sold hot chicken at extortionist prices to fund a community land trust in Black neighborhoods. And your stated goal was that gentrification is outrageous. And so you came up with an equally outrageous plan to fix it. And I was just curious, where does this like absurdist tendency, where does this come from? I don't know. That's a great, that's a great question. I think, or well, let me just be generous and say my mother, my mother is wild. I tell people that my mother has Miami stripper dreams. My mother's like <laughs> 73. I'm, I'm so serious. You my have to, but please explain and, that. <laughs> yeah. She's 73 years old and she wants to like, be flewed out. She's always she's like, take me on a cruise. She wants to like have, I'm just like wild shit. There are no limitations. And the closer it is to outrageous and impossible, that's where she lives. Like if you have a problem, my mom would be like, let's call Oprah right now. And she will help us. And my, and my mom wants to, she once told me, she said, look, just get me Oprah's phone number. That's all I need. I'll do the rest of the hard work. I'm like, mommy, <laughs> Getting Oprah's phone number is the hard work. <laughs> That's the hard work. <laughs> like, there's nothing else beyond that. So, I, you know, I think like if there's some sort of like genetic connection, it's like that. My mom is always, even right now, she's in the hospital, she's thinking about some crazy shit that she's about to do next. You know, so maybe that's where it comes from. But I don't know, really. I want to bring another Detroit cultural worker and writer, Adrian Marie Brown, into the mix and ask you, how does pleasure factor into your work and you know you're attentive to mise en place like everything is beautiful but then you're also always towing the line between aesthetics and politics just explain that concept a little bit more yeah my work to me is not about food at all maybe you feel the same way like your work isn't about necessarily the title the immediate title attached to the work it's like there are all these structural issues that exist that i need a medium through which to communicate them. And food happens to be the medium. So to me, food is disposable. However, I think food is like breathing. You know, like we don't, like by the time the diner comes into the space, I'm not interested in regaling them with stories about how long it took me to make it or how delicious it is or any of that. It's in the background, just like breathing. Like you don't know when you're breathing. I feel the same way about food. It's like I spend, I was thinking about it, like I would spend like three days by myself cooking alone to like put out the dinner. But like once I put the plates in front of the guests, like I don't talk about the dinner. If we use breath as the analogy, it's like breath animates us completely. You know, it does so much work, but we don't consider it. In the interaction with the, with the diner, I, I just think 
it should like be in the back in the background to support the work of living. And in the dining space or in the digital space, the work of living is the work of like addressing some of these structural issues. Or even now, for me, the interpersonal issues that in aggregate create the structural issues that we are facing. There is a destination or at least a path. And that path isn't the path to enjoyment, is the path towards like a particular purpose. But on that path, something my brother said to me is like, if you stay on your path, everything you want is on that path. But if you go off that path, then you're going to miss everything else. That's, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to talk about food just a little bit more. And I wanted to ask you how you describe your food. And I'm asking that sort of going beyond this idea of comfort or discomfort. But, you know, if you're cooking primarily Nigerian food and Nigeria is a big place, right? There's lots of tribes or peoples, you know, and so there's different kinds of food. Are you considering your food diasporic? Is it fusion? Is it hybrid? Are you rejecting categorization at all? When I became more specific about my work, I said I cook regional southwestern Nigerian food mostly. But really in practice, Nigerian food is the base and I go from there. And I don't know where I'm going, depending on what I'm doing. So like, I did a dinner one time in, in New Orleans. It was a, a ramen dinner, but like, she was like Nigerian food to me. I did the sort of soft-boiled egg in the style that I'm familiar with. The broth was crayfish and iru and iruru, which is calabash, nutmeg. You know, I mean, folks can call that fusion because, you know, language is semantic. But I think that the food that I'm doing is like Nigerian food. That's just what it is. But then I was doing traditional Nigerian food and I got bored with that and I just started doing different things. So that's, I would say Nigerian food, but, uh, you know, if, if I did cook a meal, depending on where I was, it might not be immediately recognizable to, say, a Nigerian, but the flavors would probably. Can you talk a little bit about any compromises that you've made, particularly when it comes to menus or ingredients that you hope never to repeat? When I had the restaurant in New Orleans or the stall, the Lagos stall, the business was failing fantastically. At one point in time, because like people weren't like checking for, you know, what we call swallow here, which is like dense ball of um, starch with uh, leafy vegetables too. Like people weren't checking for that. They came to New Orleans, they wanted to eat you know, shrimp etouffee, and if they were going to try anything else, it'd be like a, a cold chicken sandwich or a, a chia seed and avocado salad. These were literally things at the market that I was in. So I was like, yo, I need to make some sales. So I made this stewed chicken sandwich. I basically like toasted some bread and I made a Yoruba stew, which is red bell peppers, onions, and uh, tomatoes, and you season it, and then you fry it, and you sort of like poach it and all that stuff with some chicken that I had done the same thing to, add, you know, like poached chicken, then I fried it, then I baked it. So it's like, I call it a thrice-cooked chicken. And then I shredded the chicken into the stew. That became the filling for the sandwich, and people loved it. But I'm like, yo, I didn't come here to make fucking chicken sandwiches. So I made a choice as the company was, or the business was like failing, like, yo, I'm not going to do this. Like if I, if I was going to go out, I was going to go out serving a bar and a goosey and okra soup, you know, like that's what it was going to be. Yeah. Um, being an African person, cooking African food in a U.S. context is still I don't know, for lack of a better term, exotic, right? So there's a way in which I could imagine you would be invited to conferences or pop-ups or other kinds of spaces, and then you show up and you are feted as something new and different, um, which is, a, you know, a, a t being a token of some kind of progress on behalf of that organization. And so I was just curious what your experience was like but related to you have this very specific aim. And the reality is, in order to move that work along, you need resources, you need access, you need exposure, so to speak. And so oftentimes that comes as a token, right? It comes as a token opportunity. And I think just wanting to think about what is the tension between this is my project and this might be the path to get there. Yeah, 
I think that tokenization is a reality. If you're, if you're playing a game for resources, I find it hard to imagine a, a situation where you wouldn't be tokenized. But there's also a difference, right? There's a difference between other people tokenizing you and then you like performing in agreement with that tokenization or you being present while it's happening. I think it all comes down to, to politics. Like I can't live a life that insulates me from things that I am uncomfortable with. And I'm, I'm sure that's true for many people. That's a realization that I, that I have. Like I'm a villain myself to folks, right? And so if I see people who have been villainized in one aspect, but they have other aspects of themselves that I can connect to, I, I try to make that connection. Just to sort of like concretize this, I think about money. I think about the work that I'm doing, needing resources. I don't think any money is bad. I don't think anybody is bad. I think that they are bad aspects to money and bad aspects to people. But I think if I engage with people or I engage with money to further the work that I'm doing, I make sure that I am engaging with them and collecting resources, or engaging with money and collecting resources without collecting the ideology that I do not favor. But it's, it's hard to articulate that to folks, as, you know, especially, you know, when folks tend to demonize money or demonize people I think of things as multifaceted because that's how I am. I have like really horrible sides and I have sides that of me that are lovely. I think there's an opportunity to, to connect to like different sides of things and different sides of people. And so if I'm in a situation where I'm tokenized, if it's in service of the work that I'm doing, if I'm not adopting the ideology behind the tokenization and I perceive like an opportunity for uh, a greater reward despite the cost, then I would participate. And I think this is life to me. This is politics. Yeah. I always think about back to most deaths, Black on both sides. And I think it was the first time I had sort of thought about it's all slave trading paper. You know, like I've never let that go um, when I think about money. And so actually when pivoting very directly I love that you said when you were 16, you were thinking about marriage trade and stocks because so much of your work is coming back to transaction and capital and currency, right? There are major motifs in your work. And particularly with your project Bullshit.Money, which is this digital token share redeemable for a food-based product or experience curated by you. It's a really interesting take on using the master's tools to kind of poke at the master's house you know, I think the breakdown of bull is in a Wall Street bull, chit as in a token for trade, um, which is, you know, a word really legible throughout the British Commonwealth. Also, of course, it sounds like bullshit. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, like we've been talking about, right? Like it's it's using satire. Um, it's exploring. I'm imagining some kind of anti-capitalism or at least sort of like thinking through what capitalism is doing. And I'm really curious, is this simply tongue-in-cheek critique of crypto, or is it really meant to get us thinking about other kinds of currency and ways of circulating resources? Yeah, so I think it's all those things. I think my general position is like, yo, the shit is so complex, the monetary system. You know, I am not big enough to change sentiment, but there's an opportunity to make a demonstration and that demonstration can live in some sort of archive of dissent and that folks can reference, even if it's small and talked away in the corner. There's a finance scholar, Perry Merling. He says something to the effect that financial transactions are our social reality. If you think about when you interact with folks, interact with strangers the most, at least for me, it's like when you're making a purchase, like that's the most consistent thing I think we do. We buy things. It's a social reality. You know, trade existed long before um, capitalism. And so my work now is sort of like focused on these moments, these transactional moments, because they represent a social possibility, a possibility to demonstrate where we are. But I think for me, the demonstration is important and sort of like what you think the critique of the work is, is true. And then 
every other thing we find out about what the critique could be and what the problem is, is also true. You know, because we need to design solutions that are as ingenious as what the problems are. And I think part of ingenuity is not thinking through what all the solutions are, but like designing a framework that can, that can accommodate more and more solutions. So when I started this bullshit, I'd, I'd, actually, I'd actually been reading about, about stocks and bonds and stuff like that. But the way it worked out and the way it, I designed it, it sort of spoke to crypto as well. I, I just think that speaks to like an underlying reality of financialization and products that they all come from the same base motivation to make profit, to be speculative and to cause considerable financial loss and considerable financial gain. There are other possibilities that they create, but these are the things that undergird global financialization. I, I just hope that the work that I do, you know, if it reflects the foundation and you know, when folks interact with it, it can iterate and morph in different ways to satisfy all the realities that are present and possible. I want to uplift another project, your luxury palm wine company, Synth Spirits, where palm wine is sold in the U.S. for $192.76 per bottle which is a figure you created by dividing Nigeria's external debt borrowed from foreign lenders, almost $38 billion, by the number of drinking age people living in the United States. And so I wanted you to say more about this. Why is it significant for you to work with palm wine and why charge it to the U.S.? Yeah, I think the um, palm wine was a personal um, happenstance. I was doing some filming in the center of the country, Kogi State, with this fellow who was touring us around rice farms. And then when we sat down, they brought Ogogoro, which is the spirit distilled from palm wine. And I thought it was amazing. I loved it so much. I, I sent it to my brother. I sent him like, I think a 15 gallon container. I'm like, yo, try this shit. So we were drinking it at home and I was drinking it. I was, I was making martinis at my crib in Shomolu, which is a sort of like working class suburb over here and my brother would joke that i was making molu martinis like but i enjoyed it and then i just started thinking as i as i do sometimes about the work that i wanted to do which is you know talk about a value a global value chain that continues to disregard black folks on the continent and a global economic system that is so fucked that it denies monetary sovereignty to nigerians and folks on the continent and that our currencies are either pegged to the dollar or pegged to the euro, even if they aren't pegged because all of international trade is invoiced in dollars, or most of it anyway, not all of it. Um, like we are subject to these forex fluctuations that cause high unemployment, that cause high interest rates, or, and also cause debt in foreign currency. And re in response to all of this, you have these international financial organizations like pressing upon us these restrictions that create more problems. They call them structural adjustments, but they don't adjust the larger structure. They adjust the folks who are suffering the symptoms of the structure. So we're just like in this cycle of debt, poverty, and bullshit, which is not to absolve us of any responsibility, but to just highlight or uplift what this sort of like superstructure is that exists. I want to talk about this all the time. In my home, I haven't had power for like a week and a half. You know, the roads are, are shit. The hospitals are shit. And so it is an opportunity to get people to like consume this information by imbibing a drink that is going to be delicious. Then I want to like to share this and be like blunt about it. You know, there are a lot of so I, I'm saying that like you're going to drink this drink and you're not going to save anything. You're not going to change anything. Uh, in fact, you're going to be contributing more to the systemic erosion of our economic and social and political system. And to highlight that point, this exorbitant fee based on the external debt that Nigeria has, and then at least be aware that this drink, if you consume it as art, if you consume it as some sort of a limited edition product as a foodie or some sort of theoretical 
position that, that, you know, that you agree with or don't agree with, whatever your consumption motivation is, it is connected to the dire material dispossession of folks on the continent. I mean, I love the idea. I wish it was more affordable for me, but I often think about alcohol in particular, the distillation of rum and its, you know, <laughs> connection to enslavement and global capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So I love sort of even bringing it back to the continent, but I, I feel like it's working on multiple levels, which is one sort of introducing a new spirit into foodie culture, which is important, um, but also then reminding us of this materiality and economic impact. So, you know, um, I also want to ask you about there's a similarity I'm, I'm thinking about between kitchens and film sets and their militarized spaces, right? Very much taking their cues from military movement. And I know you're new to sort of the film space, but I'm, I'm curious on a kitchen level, if you've thought about decolonizing the kitchen, you know, was there anything that you have done or are thinking about doing, you know, that disrupts how kitchens are run? So I've never really run a kitchen in a conventional sense. Like, so when I did dinners, I did dinners in other people's kitchens. So either I had free range of the kitchen with nobody in there, probably at midnight, because that was the only time I could use the kitchen, or I worked with your staff, or at uh, the sort of like store that I had in New Orleans, it was a shared kitchen. So multiple, multiple people were there. If you're trying to cook a meal, Democracy doesn't work there. Like that is not the way to cook in a modern kitchen. Like when I go into kitchens and I'm working with people who are familiar with that kitchen, like my position is I'm coming in there with food that they don't know about. And I'm trying to serve it to their customers or my customers too. I tell folks like, yo, make this a goosey. And I give them like broad directions and they come back and they're like, yo, I don't know how to make this. I'm like, yo, it's it's chill. Whatever you feel, if it tastes good, go ahead and do that. But then I promise you, there's always some motherfucker who like in the kitchen, like because you are open and that openness is different from, from what they're used to. And I've had like sous chefs or people who work at restaurants that have never tasted Nigerian food before come and challenge me about things. Like they start telling me how to cook the shit. And I have to like check them and say like, yo, you know, this is not what you think it is. I know I'm being friendly and stuff, but like, can you just please do what I'm I'm, I'm asking you to do? Because this is this is what I need done. And so all that to say is like, I think that in kitchens, and you see this especially in like social profit enterprises that are centered on kitchens, where you know folks are using a kitchen to train quote-unquote, at-risk folk to sell some food. Those things don't usually work because you're trying to inject an ideology into a space that rejects that. If you're trying to change the system, if you're trying to change sort of like the, mil- the militaristic tendencies of kitchens, I think you have to change the larger system. The only caveat I would say is that abuse is different from you know, strict leadership. And strict leadership works, but it's not a universal answer to all situations. I think in kitchens, if you're trying to meet a certain like guest quota, you're trying to produce like quality food, there needs to be some sort of hierarchy or some sort of division of labor. It doesn't have to be abusive, doesn't have to be coercive or emotionally manipulative or destructive, but there has to be an order that exists. I, I, I agree with that. I was just, it's, it's something that we've been talking a lot about in film space. Also, I think not trying to flatten the structure, but to think about ways to kind of decolonize disrespect for people's roles. Um, I want to start wrapping us up. And so I have some easier questions. <laughs> um, what else are you interested in taking on? You know, you've been food, writing, you've started in film, you know, what other disciplines are you imagining you'll explore? I don't know. I think that, man, I'm just trying to work on myself right now because that is a discipline I need to master. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to do, to work on me. Yeah, that's, that's it. 
that's the discipline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what do you have coming up next? I'm actually going to be in Pittsburgh. I have a residency at the Lewis Center. Um, it's sort of a center, an art center that supports artists of color. So I'm going to be there writing and working on my other projects for the next three months, starting in starting April, I think, 16th or 17th. And then um, I really want to like challenge or to be in conversation with affluent Nigerians to situate them in the larger problem that is Nigeria. So I have a show that I'm working on sometime in the American summer or the Western summer that I'll be doing here. And then I have a show in Baton Rouge in the fall, and maybe in Los Angeles. I'm creating a post-apocalyptic restaurant that really stretches the comfort of the guests because they are they have been dropped into uh, some sort of future that is a product of environmental degradation and some sort of super pandemic. And so how do you dine in a post-apocalyptic world? And then I'm, I'm writing. I have a book that I should have finished four years ago that I'm writing. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what has been like a meal or snack that's been your go-to lately that maybe sort of has developed in the pandemic or, you know, just sort of where are you finding some comfort with food yeah. these days? So I eat what's called white beans and fried sweet plantains like literally three times a day, every day. I don't cook at home. I haven't cooked the last six months since I've been here in Lagos. Across the street from me is this lady and her daughter. We've, been, we've become friends and I just like, I buy my food from her every day and it's just, it's everything. And that's what I eat. That is the most Virgo thing you've said this entire <laughs> interview. <laughs> I, my mother is a Virgo and I have several friends that are and they have the capacity to eat the same thing and I do not understand. But that's great. Um, are there any dream collaborators that you would like to work with in the future? Besides yourself? <laughs> Smooth. No, I'm just, that's real. I mean, you did say in 2016 I reached out to you, so it's it's, a, it's been a long-standing dream. You know, I was I actually met this fellow. Maybe you know him. I'm sure you do. Actually, Andrew Dosomu. Do you know him? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. On some random shit, like friends of mine in Lagos are friends of his, and they invited me out to some sort of music thing, and he was there, and I was just like gushing. Yeah, I don't know if I, I want to work with him, but I definitely want to like shadow him or some shit just to see how he how he moves. He's super Nigerian. He's like Lagos, yeah, Nigerian, but he's also like in that sort of art house film world, and so it's yeah, I think that's dope. Well, we have to have you at the festival, um, but that is uh, <laughs> we will talk about that offline. Thank you so much. This has been really, really, really great. I feel like. Um, I guess what most people don't know, we've been doing these shows mostly in the evening, and this is in the morning for all of us, not for <laughs> Tuesday. No, yeah. So it's very much like I woke up this morning to have class, and I, I really appreciate it. Everything that you've been saying, and I appreciate your vulnerability. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I've been looking forward to this. And yeah, it was everything that I thought it was going to be and more. So thank you. To explore more of Tunde's work, visit his website, fromlagos.com. Follow Tunde on Instagram at from underscore Lagos. You can find his recipe for jollof rice at cooking.nytimes.com. This season of Many Lumens is brought to you by Open Society Foundations. It is produced by Black Star Projects in partnership with Rohome Productions. The host and executive producer of Many Lumens is me, Maori Carmel Holmes. Our producer is Imani Leonard. Associate producers are Irit Reinheimer and Farah Rahman. Managing producer is Alex Lewis. Executive editor is John Myers. Our music supervisor is David Little Dave Adams, Black Star's music and cinema fellow, supported by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by Little Dave. This episode features music by Lolade. 
You can explore more of her music at lolademusic.com. Sending you light and see you next time.